Also, not well understood, very difficult to study, something that once it's damaged, it's very hard to fix. And we'll talk about some of the things that, that, that um, affect that. And it's pretty unique to humans. Humans actually different than the, the great apes, so gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, have a different placentation process than, um, than great apes. And the reality is, is, is the human placentation process is pretty aggressive and the, the placenta of an embryo invades fairly deep. And there are conditions where the placenta over invades and damages the uterus and things like that. So, but to study human implantation, we really can't do. So we talk about doing studies on mice and rats and cows and sheep and so on, but the reality is, is the human endometrium is different than that. And the human placentation process is different than that. So just a little anatomy here. So you've got the vagina down below, and that leads to the female external genitalia. You have the cervix. When women go to the gynecologist, the gynecologist is putting in that speculum and looking at the cervix. That's all they're looking at. They're taking a swab from the cervix to screen for cervical cancer and other inflammatory states. This external os, so the lower part of the cervix, is what they're swabbing. Above there is the internal os. The internal os is actually what keeps a pregnancy inside until it's ready, until hopefully nine months. And so that internal os is very made of very hard tissue. It has a lot of connective tissue within it, kind of like the tissue in your nose, different than a soft muscle. So the reason why for many women labor is so painful is this internal os literally has to be pulled open, contraction by contraction, by this big muscle known as the uterus. Now, above the internal os is what we call the fundus of the uterus. It is a muscle, and that's when women have their menstrual period, which what contracts, that's when women deliver babies, what contracts. Now here's the little highway here, what I, the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes, you have two fallopian tubes, you have two ovaries, you have one uterus, okay? So the fallopian tubes are how sperm and egg get together. So one thing just to understand is, is that your ovaries are completely embryologically distinct from the, your uterus. They're completely separate. It's like the difference between your eyes and your heart. All right? But the ovary releases the egg. The egg gets picked up by this fallopian tube, which if you see it in the body, it's like a giant sea anemone. It just floats around and it's gonna be near the ovary with the time of ovulation. And sperm have to travel through the female reproductive tract to, to basically find the egg. So as far as a better understanding of the process, remember your compartments. Your brain receives messages from the rest of the world and says, okay, it's okay for reproduction. We're gonna secrete follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. That's gonna make the ovaries make estrogen and progesterone. And that estrogen and progesterone is gonna make the uterus start the process of growing a menstrual cycle in an attempt to become pregnant. Every single natural menstrual cycle is an attempt to become pregnant. Because as a as an organism, the first thing you need to do is eat, the next thing you need to do is reproduce, whether you're a little fly or a human being. So that's the drive. So the whole purpose of the menstrual cycle is for reproduction. And, uh, and it's something really to be protected as well, because when it goes wrong, sometimes there can be other, a little bit more damage that goes on, sometimes it can't be fixed. So slide number 10 is basically what we just went through. So it talks about the brain. So can women who are under stress lose their menstrual cycles? Yes, all right? Where does that stress come from? It's the, the way your brain perceives its environment. Stress can be external stress. Stress can be that you're unhealthy. Stress can be that you're too thin. Stress can be that you're too overweight. Stress can be medications. Stress can be other hormones, right? So the, your, your brain then tells your hypothalamus that it's okay to reproduce. The hypothalamus, once again, releases follicle stimulating hormone, affects the ovaries. And I put the, the breast in here. The breast is really a reproductive tissue, right? 
I mean, the, the breast is very important to nurturing an early human infant, right? That is its role. So with the start of puberty, remember, we said breast development begins first. And another strange thing to think of for women in, in here who have been pregnant, one of the first signs of pregnancy is breast tenderness. Well, breasts are not reproductively capable of producing milk until a pregnancy becomes ongoing. They have to go through terminal differentiation to become a lactating breast. So some of the changes in pregnancy are changes in, the, in, in breast development that are distinct from a woman who's never been pregnant. And anyone who's ever been pregnant, I think they, they would all agree that their breasts sometimes are different after delivery than they were before delivery. Because the whole purpose of the breast is to basically nourish a human infant. So as far as the, the next slide here, this is basically my whole world here. So as women transition from childhood into puberty, slide number 13, the menstrual cycle begins to work. So box one is the brain, FSH and LH that we've talked about. Box two is the ovary, estrogen and progesterone secreted. Box three is the uterus. So what really happens is that these three pieces have to work in sequence and together. And if they don't work together, there's dysfunction. Now, birth control pills. They just had the 50th anniversary birth control pill. Actually, depending on your opinion and perspective, birth control pills have allowed women to not simply be baby-making machines, and they've allowed them to maybe take some control of their fertility if they choose to be sexually active early, before they're ready to start a family. Birth control pills act at the level of the, the brain, at the level of the hypothalamus pituitary action axis. What are birth control pills? They're estrogen and progesterone. So your brain thinks the ovary's working fine, so I don't need to drive the ovary, so everything's quiet. But then you can say, but I still get a menstrual cycle, doctor. You just said it, that estrogen and progesterone run the menstrual cycle. Well, what happens, if you've ever looked at a birth control pill pack, there's those seven days of the different colored pills. Those seven days of the different colored pills are no estrogen and progesterone. So you're taking seven days of placebo pills, basically, the sugar pills. And with the sugar pills, your uterus says, okay, well, we're not pregnant this month, I'm gonna have a period. You may or may not see on the market now they have pills that you can take for three months without having a period, and they're fine. They're actually very safe for most women. You should obviously talk to your doctor before you go on them, but, but basically, birth control pills allow the brain to think that reproduction is going on in the background, and your ovary does not produce its own estrogen and progesterone. As far as the ovarian cycle, thyroid disease in women is actually very common. It's about 8% of <coughs> women throughout their lifespan. And the, your thyroid hormone, your thyroid is a gland in your neck, and that same pituitary that drives ovary production also drives thyroid production of a thyroid hormone. Your thyroid hormone is like your, runs your metabolic rate. So if your thyroid hormone is not enough, you're gonna, you might gonna feel sluggish and tired and maybe have dry skin. If your thyroid hormone is working too fast, you've got too much, you might have heart palpitations, be too thin and be hot all the time. The reality is, is that, the, that to have a properly working metabolic system is essential to having a healthy pregnancy. So if the thyroid axis is not working well, you might have irregular menstrual cycles and you might actually stop having menstrual cycles and you may become subfertile or infertile. So thyroid disease we acts probably primarily at the level of the ovary. There's another syndrome out there called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is actually more prevalent than diabetes in women. It's about 10% of the female population. And that's when the ovary for different reasons, maybe because the brain's over-secreting FSH and LH, 